Project to the hill, stamped on the map like the compass. Say this poor play tongue twist, pierce the holes in you. You can't escape. 70,000 kilowatts, black and your box, walk with a long box. Cars drivers go down the block. One stop pops, pops in trunk. Stamp pops loud as drop shots. Face like a lady in your face. Cops stop, give a citation. We pull for a new picture. I'm going to change that with the age of boys that they handle the fifth like John Hannibal Smith. Put the ammo in the clip. Catch you in the alleyway, blam you in the rib. Run up in your crib, go gorilla on your family. And it ain't about a rap song, they do it for the cash home. What comes around goes around. You might catch one if you own this town. And that's well known, so hold it down. When you try to blame hip hop for who gets shot, no amount of horror series um, called Critical Conversations. And this is three quarters of our committee. Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Anita Hernandez, will be here today to join us. Um, but I want to welcome you on our behalf and just say a little bit about the lecture series. Um, this is uh, a lecture series that was developed out of an IDEA grant out of the office of the provost. So we're very fortunate um, to be able to bring dynamic speakers like Dr. Ocom, um and Dr. Nelson Maldonado Torres and um, our first two speakers, Dr. Yoso and Dr. Garcia. So thank you for those of you who've been following sort of the pattern of our speakers. Um, we really encourage you to check into our, we have a Facebook page and a blog and um, if you're interested in, in checking into those spaces to start having more of a dialogue online that can hopefully translate into on the ground conversations, then we welcome that as well so we can give you more information about how to tap into those media. And we're not the proficient media experts, um, but we have someone who's um, helping us with the technology. Saba, thank you for uh, making that part possible for us. Um, these lecture series come out of a desire to uh, encourage open and honest dialogue, um, not just about diversity, but about issues of race, um, racism and discrimination. Uh, we think that we need to have open dialogue on campus about issues that have been um, going on on campus, but also in our communities. There's been some incidences that have made it to the news in El Paso, locally in Las Cruces, um, affecting underrepresented communities. And so, um, these, these series also started from us hearing from our students and our colleagues and people in the community that want to have a voice but don't feel like they have a forum. So we're really pleased to, to have these dialogue with you. And um, as a special guest, um, Dr. Colm has offered to facilitate small group discussions after his lecture so that we can break up and talk to each other and, and have um, an honest dialogue about, about these issues. So I, I thank him for joining us. <coughs> and I thank you for being a part of that. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm uh, Dulcinea Lara, Dr. Lara, to my students. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the program. Uh, I'm Antonio Lara. I'm in the Department of Chemistry here on campus. And it's been an eye-opener for me because I come from the physical sciences. And uh, we are so divorced from the rest of the world. It's amazing. And so it's been an eye-opener. And it's uh, to somehow make a link to the real world. And I think many of us should do that, and, and especially from where I come from. So it's been an, an honor and to join this and to have my mind broadened in this fashion. I'm very grateful. I am Marisol Ruiz from the College of Education. And in, you know, in our classes, we try to teach the pedagogy of social justice and to make curriculum relevant to our youth. And not only relevant, but also to do something, to act, action. And that's where we need to go. Like we just don't <coughs> teach the knowledge, and, and which is organically known by the people, but then we must resist. And how do we resist? We need to have the tools of how to act and how to change the situations that oppress us. And so that's why we're so fortunate to have a comb here to enlighten us and give us even even give us ideas of how we can do this, how we can implement this here in Las Cruces. And I have flyers for the rest of the series and please join us afterwards. Okay. Great. So I want to introduce Dr. Combe is the founding director of the Institute for Sustainable Economic Educational and Environmental Design, I see which focuses on creating sustainable cities and schools so that people do not have to leave their communities in order to live, learn, work, and thrive. 
Dr. Hercomb is nationally recognized for designing models of schooling for sustainability and building college and career pathways in clean energy economy. As one of the nation's leaders in integrating youth development, workforce development, STEM education, and culturally responsive pedagogy, his solution-driven models not only help build sustainable futures by training the next generation of climate scientists and energy innovators, but also introduce new framework for reducing health and educational disparities, alleviating poverty, and competing in the 21st century clean energy economy. Current doc currently, Dr. Combe is an assistant professor of environmental Associate. Associate. We're tenured people. <laughs> Ari is an associate professor. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, associate professor, environmental sociology, public health, and STEM education at San Francisco State University. And during 2011, has been a visiting professor at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories and Environmental Energy and Technology Division. Dr. Combe has received numerous national awards from Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, American Education Research Research. Blah, 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 blah. Let's get this going. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> New Mexico State University, how are you? Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I came here today uh, initially thinking that I was going to talk about uh, race, power, and the environment, uh, and I am going to do that, um, but I sort of did my research and did my homework about what's been happening in this community, so I changed the title of my talk to Race, Power, Privilege, the Environmental Determinants of Educational Success, um, so we're still sort of hitting all the things I initially wanted to talk about, but there were some additional linkages that I wanted to make sure I shared with you and that we had a dialogue about uh, with each other. So basically, the way that this conversation, and it is a conversation, is going to happen is I'm going to break in with an overview of a racial toxins framework. Uh, I'm going to introduce a key theoretical concept uh, that I have developed called eco-apartheid. And that's building off of Van Jones's work and Doug Massey's work, who's at Prince, both are at Princeton University right now. Then we're going to map eco-apartheid and sort of really examine uh, how does the environment impact education. Uh, and then we're going to talk about solutions. So the first part of the conversation is really, hey, this is how I see the problem that we're dealing with. The second part is, this is what I think we should be doing about it, and this is what I'm doing about it, and how can we build and work together to really resolve these issues. So the key questions that I'm going to address in this conversation are, how does racism get embedded in the body, penetrate the skin, and affect health and educational outcomes? Right? How does racism penetrate the body, get underneath the skin, and affect health and educational outcomes? In other words, what does racism look like in the 21st century? Right? We're going we're gonna to examine that together, because we know it doesn't look the same as it has in the past. So how is it manifesting in the 21st century? Second, why is where you live, where we live, such an important predictor of educational success, health, and well-being? Right? How is it that your zip code can literally determine how long you live? Right? Let's, let's, let's talk about that right? and what, what we can do to uh, make sure that it's not as predictable as it currently is. And then the solution piece, which is how do we train the next generation of climate scientists, energy innovators, social justice educators, STEM educators, and I'm going to introduce this concept of STEAM education. I'll talk about that in a minute. Particularly, my work is focused on folks from low-income communities and or communities of color. <coughs> right? I, I'm, I'm into and I have aligned myself with poor folks, and I am a person of color. I'm there for everybody, but those are my two main constituencies. So my point of departure is the problem of the 21st century is really the problem of climate justice and corporate greed. Right? In particular, how the climate justice movement and now more recently this Occupy movement are responding to growing issues of racial, gender, and socioeconomic 
inequality. Long before Hurricane Katrina, or more recently, the No Child Left Behind, or Obama's Race to the Top, low-income communities and communities of color from West Harlem all the way to East Los Angeles, or from the Cancer Alley that runs from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, all the way to New Orleans, or from the Toxic Triangle, where I do my own work, which runs from Richmond, California, all the way down through Berkeley, into Oakland, and across to San Francisco, to a place called Bayview Hunters Point. Long before Hurricane Katrina, low-income communities and communities of color, we knew that there was a health-wealth gap. Right? We knew that there were eco-haves and eco-have-nots. We knew that race and class played a role, <coughs> and gender, in terms of who gets left behind with respect to housing, education, uh, health care, et cetera. Right? But what Hurricane Katrina did, or more recently the BP oil spill, or any of the heat waves that have been affecting us, right? and to a certain extent, but not to the place where I really want it to, the Occupy movement, what these things are trying, some did and some are trying to do, was they blew the lid off of environmental racism and the color-coded ways in which our government responds and our universities respond to some of our nation's most vulnerable populations. <coughs> and I start there because even though the problem of the 21st century is <coughs> climate change, which is being fueled by corporate greed, there is a second climate crisis growing alongside the first with devastating effects and similar social origins. And it is a crisis of our human imagination. It is a crisis of our human intervention. It is a crisis of our human mobilization. And collectively, it is the crisis of our educational system. So we have two climate crises happening at the same time, right? both with devastating effects regarding the future of our planet. We have the collapse of our ecological systems, and we have the collapse of our educational systems. But yet, not enough people are talking about the relationship between the two. Right? Not enough people are talking about how the environment and environmental health impacts our school and school children. But yet we've got, we've got lead in the paint. We've got arsenic in the water. We've got PCBs in the windows. We've got asbestos in our ceilings and in our floors. Right? We're at a point where the building stock in urban and rural communities is so dilapidated and so dysfunctional that it's creating what I call toxic toddlers. 